No, you aren't saying things. We signed Dominic Soboslai. Why not? With nine goals and four assists and these awesome attributes, replacing him after his loan was going to be a challenge. However, after failing to sign Fabio Vieira, I decided to search the Hungarian to see if he was in Unai's plans. He was transfer listed. So throw in an 85 million bid and all the wages for him to permanently join. Now, how could we afford him? So Plus, we sold several others. Raspadori and Di Lorenzo might raise some eyebrows, although the attacker was more of a squad player and with his 56 million transfer, we were able to finish off the rest of our business. Colpani from Monza with a 7.25 million bid, Orsolini at 12 and a half, and Endrick for 11 million. <laughs> Not sure what accountant overlooked that. With Di Lorenzo, we fell out, and he wanted to explore his contract options. So I was about to send him to Roma. Until Barca arrived with a better bid. Rest in piss, Mourinho. Finally, Justin Che would come in to back up Coyote. In net, I did want Diogo Costa to replace Murray, but Saudi give it, and Saudi take it away for 1.2 million euros a week. Is it better to leave out on a high? Spalletti did in 2023. But should Cruccini have done the same after one-upping him for the double? Well, it's difficult to do that when his ambitions go one step higher. Become European champions. Of course, we still want to retain the league. But a difficult start was turning Cruccini into Neo, taking each challenge and winning 8 of the first 10. Unfortunately, there was a Mourinho-sized blemish. They were firing to begin the season and took a 2-0 lead on us. However, we were able to come back with a penalty and Argentine dark arts with Nico Gonzalez's bicycle kick going in off Dybala. Sally, Mourinho's 18th attempt at humiliation came into fruition as Darmian scored from outside the box with his weak foot. Roma would slow down, but somehow stayed within reach of the top. The league phase of the Champions League looked to be good on paper. We had a fair amount of winnable matches, and only two I was really concerned about, yet the campaign didn't go as anticipated. Well, that's not entirely true. We did defeat Shakhtar Donetsk. Manchester City at the Etihad was one of the games where a loss wouldn't stun me. Their Premier League reign would extend to six consecutive triumphs, including the previous season where they won on the final day versus Liverpool with two goals in the closing 10 minutes. Yet Toribo was able to pierce through them with two headers, stunning the Champions League finalists. Following were three German clubs. Ah! Not sure why we couldn't get some variety. I expected the wins to continue, but boy, I was wrong. At Leverkusen, we had a glorious opportunity wasted in the six yard box. On the other side, Boniface casually struck this. Toribo running to him and showing the space to shoot was very nice of him. Boniface would bang in another 18 yarder on the other side of the pitch. I don't know if we used all of our luck versus Manchester City, as Andrik couldn't score a one on one, the first loss, and Borussia Mönchengladbach was looking similar. We actually scored, but so did our opponents. Three in an hour, which made me look like a moron with Kvara and Nico on the bench. Upon entering the pitch, their presence was felt straight away, with Nico winning a pen and Kvara smacking it in. We were inching closer to an equalizer, but the ball wasn't going in, and when it did, it was disallowed. That didn't deter us, as past added time, Coyote's cross found Kvara, and he equalized. Still a frustrating result especially because with soon-to-be Bundesliga winners RB Leipzig and their Kylo Ren-inspired tactic. In the 86th minute, Murray somehow allowed this from Zaywald, which was probably powerful, but come on, man. We don't give up, though, and Nico got to his spot. Both posts. While Simeone loves himself a miss. Another loss, and with Barcelona next, top eight was looking impossible. Last year's Champions League winners did eliminate us in that run. Yeah, we did defeat them at home, and in this rematch, they used that formation. Nothing to mention until the latter 45, and this Murray kick will be the beginning of the party. Three first-time touches led to Nico grabbing us the lead. Straight away, Barca switched to match our 4-3-3. That was no problem for Nico, who cut into midfield to find Coplani's head, leading to Simeone rounding Peña. That should be that. For some teams, this would shift the momentum, but not when Nico Gonzalez is feeling the way he is. The Argentine absolutely danced on his opponents. Barca scored another long shot. You've seen a lot of those go in, 
and the same can be said about corners. Antonio Silva would get her fourth, confirming a gigantic victory over Barca. Both Champions League finalists were defeated, but please no more German clubs. The table was looking good, but six points were needed in the remaining two matches. So being down by two at halftime versus Inazio's goons, it nearly caused me to cancel my February spa session. Despite throwing the bottle and summing up Matisse Oliveira, nothing changed. That's when I thought, let's do the 4-3-3, but different. Our three strikers versus their three center backs. Overloading the box and throw-ins impacted them straight away with Giovanni Simeone. 15 minutes left and two were needed, so who better to call than the bald Don? A draw would still be bad, but in the 95th minute, another throw-in led to Coyote, whose deflected shot landed on Endrick's boot. Onside, and the winner. We got away with that. Top 8 could go down a goal difference. So against Maccabi Haifa... So here's... Big 8! Those 8 goals were enough, as we booked our tickets to the round of 16. Rewinding a few weeks back though, we had the Super Copa in China. Regardless, we defeated Lazio in the semi-final, leading to a battle with AC Milan. Not the most prestigious competition, but a trophy is a trophy. We've had crazy battles with Milan in Season 1, and this had the same vibes. It started amazingly with Clara giving us a 2 goal advantage. Milan were nowhere to be found, but in the second, they noticed we didn't have a player on top of the box for corners. They missed this opportunity, but we didn't adjust, leading to another chance where with some extra work, Pulisic scored. It was beginning to unravel, as in the next 5 minutes, we conceded 2, which were fairly preventable. Yet, we got what others don't. Grit. Or how the Italians say, Grinta, grinta, sweat, blood. Nico made it level, although we nearly threw it away. So why don't we actually do it in extra time by letting De Catalare score twice in about 70 seconds. That deficit was too much, especially for Endrick. How? As Milan lifted the Super Copa. Let's return to my favorite pastime, roasting Mourinho. His Roma were two points behind us, although we had a game in hand. Yet, he was receiving his flowers from the Italian media, with them being all positive about him. That was despite the Italian FA handing him two warnings this season for his comments. At the pre-match press conference, I told him he'd be brought back to reality. I may have said some other things too. Mourinho had nothing to say, but four goals later, he had a lot on his plate. For all that, his team did cause Moray to get injured again. On the positive, the Serie A form was pretty good. After a loss to Juventus in November, we went on a run of 14 games without a defeat. We also made a few big transfers to solidify our team for Europe. Kubo Karkamara would be the big one, as we spent a lot of excess funds on him. I won't be here long term if there are repercussions. I also brought in some margins for 26 million, since I wanted someone better than Barrios, who hasn't developed. The Spaniard would be sold to Udinese for 10 mil. With Maxime Esteve leaving for 30 plus million, Jakob Iol continued the Udinese train to fill up our squad. The quadruple was no longer possible, but we could win a treble, although two quick goals from Inter in the Coppa Italia quarters quickly vanquished that dream. Seppe was filling in, but I think retirement was on his mind. To be fair, there's nothing he could do on Inter's third. We had hoped by making it 3-2, but Barella shut that down straight away, officially killing the treble dream. Piss off! We have someone that has business with Unai, and it certainly isn't me. Liverpool was pretty similar to what you'd expect, outside of Van Dijk being in Saudi Arabia. The first leg was at Anfield, so as always, the plan was to keep it close. Who am I kidding? Salah scored in the second minute. Liverpool were vulnerable, but as is common with Endrick, he does so brilliantly until the big chance. That's where the ball dawn comes in, as he receives a pass from Sobo, and the Italian does the rest. That's nasty! At the end of the day though, this is Liverpool at Anfield, and even if it requires a tad bit of luck, they'll find a way. 2-1 isn't bad. However, the air was off today, as David Carmo does this, and Simeone takes complete advantage. Despite a scare from Gravenberg, we got a 2 all draw. While Liverpool are strong, maybe they haven't been the same since that bottling last May. Added to that, they were missing Salah for the second leg. I'm more worried about you. Thank you. We were starting off great, until we left Konate wide open from a free kick. Moments later, they would score again, making that first miss look awful. 
but the game was long, and we responded with an open Nico Gonzalez. Changing to a positive mentality at the break seemed like the right call, with Baldanzi whipping up a cross to Nico Gonzalez. All squared, and we weren't turning back. Kufara's open. <gasps> Simeone! Let's actually give the ball to more competent players. Kufara, Baldanzi. Let's go! What a performance as we advanced past Liverpool. Who'd we face in the quarterfinals? <laughs> <laughs> We actually made the Champions League semis, and not only that, but we earned a third victory over Juventus on the following weekend, which had the Serie A table looking like this. Yeah, we weren't in first. A bad draw before the Juventus tie versus Salernitana, plus a pair of losses in late February, pushed us behind. We didn't have an easy end to the season either, with Inter right before our semi-final, and AC Milan right after. At the San Siro, it wasn't looking good. Not only did they score in the first minute, but Denzel Dumfries was having the match of his life. With his brace, it was 3-1 for the Nerazzurri. Kvara was able to pull some magic out of nothing, but with my entire defense swapped out, we couldn't prevent a fourth, meaning the ball was in Inter's court. Why would I say that? Well, compare their end of season schedule to ours, and especially AC Milan's. Before that concludes, let's take on Jurgen Klopp's Real Madrid. When Jurgen Klopp left the Reds for Los Blancos, it was a shock to many, since it was a very un-Jurgen Klopp thing to do. I guess he really wanted to manage Jude Bellingham. However, he didn't bring over his entire staff, which includes Pep Lenders. That's where we came in, as Pep would replace our assistant manager, who apparently was a former gym teacher. Plus, this was Endrick's reunion with Real Madrid. Would Florentino's biggest mistake come back to bite Klopp's men? No, Endrick was crap, and so was the entire attack. We had one shot, and prior to halftime, Militao would take the lead. At the end of the day, it would be the names you know who would haunt us. Vinny, just like that. I needed this leg to be tight, and we finally created a chance thanks to Orsolini. But Simeone blew it, and on the other side, Real Madrid made it three. Maybe I should have gone cautious, but what was looking like a brilliant season turned into a huge what if in the second leg. I made a switch. And that was Martel in for Camara, and the German nodded the corner in the ninth minute. For some, this would inspire a comeback. For us, it just led to fraudulence. No, no, watch, 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 watch. He's wide open. He's wide open. <laughs> they got a second off of this, increasing their advantage to four. We were trying, but it wasn't enough. So I went to the 4 triple 2 all-out attack because what was there to lose? With Kvara being gifted a goal prior to half and nearly getting another, it inspired hope. The only thing needed was Endrick to show up. We tried and got so freaking close, but with this ruled out for offside and two goals coming far too late, we lost 5-4 on aggregate and missed out on the Champions League final. Is it better to leave on a high? If you can't match what you did previously, Maybe. And while we did make a great run in Europe, that becomes a distant memory when time flies by. In Syria, we were leading 1-0 against AC Milan on the 36th match day. A win still gave us a chance. But here's a lesson. Make sure you have a player marking on top of the box since Okafor's shot was deflected in. I made the same mistake against the same team. That resulted in a draw, making sure we went 0-4 in trophies. Despite earning more points than last season, Milan and Inter leveled up out of nowhere. I'm sure some will have good memories thinking back to the double, but maybe that's where it should have ended. It also would have been nice to buy a striker who could actually score in big moments. One last thing, thank you to my Patreon supporters. To those under the Continue the Journey tier, you can now do that with this save. 